Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 104th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. This morning we are very pleased to have as our speaker Dr. Harold Varmus, a Nobel Prize Laureate in Medicine and the Director of the National Institute of Health. Before I introduce Dr. Varmus, I would like to introduce other members of the platform party. On my right, Dr. John Havlin, Professor of Agronomy and President of the Kansas State University Faculty Senate. <laughs> Next to him, Edward Seaton, owner and publisher of the Manhattan Mercury and Chairman of the Landon Patrons. Next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, Professor of Philosophy, my Executive Assistant and Chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. <laughs> then, on my right, Jeff Peterson, a graduate student in agriculture and President of the Kansas State University student body. Jeff? <laughs> the Landon Lecture Series was started by Elk Landon in 1966. And as many of you know, it's devoted to the discussion of public issues. This is why it is so appropriate for us today to have Dr. Varmus, the director of the National Institute of Health, with us to discuss public health issues. Dr. Varmus is the first Nobel laureate to serve as director of the National Institutes of Health. He was previously a professor of microbiology, biochemistry, and biophysics, and was the American Cancer Society professor of molecular virology at the University of California, San Francisco. He is an internationally recognized authority on retroviruses and the genetic basis of cancer. Dr. Varmus and his University of California, San Francisco colleague, J. Michael Bishop, shared a Nobel Prize in 1989 for demonstrating that cancer genes can arise from normal cellular genes. His recent work has been especially relevant to aid through a focus on biochemical properties of HIV and to breast cancer through investigation of mammary tumors in mice. Dr. Varmus is the author or editor of four books and over 300 scientific papers. He has been elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His most recent book, Genes and the Biology of Cancer, is intended for a general audience and was co-authored with Robert Weinberg for the Scientific American Library. Dr. Varmus is an English literature graduate of Amherst College and received an MA from Harvard University, also in English literature. He received his MD degree from Columbia University. The recent news has been filled with reports of outbreaks of Ebola and E. coli bacteria, the spread of AIDS, the struggle for a national health plan, and questions about the future of medical practice in America. We could not have a more timely speaker than Dr. Harold Varmus. Please join with me in welcoming to the Landon Lecture Series, Dr. Harold Varmus. Well, good morning. First, let me begin with a note of gratitude to this campus. My first postdoctoral fellow was a graduate of your graduate school. Uh, one of my best students, Bruce Bowerman, a native Kansan, uh, was a student in my lab for several years, now as a professor at, the, uh, at Oregon University and Eugene, uh, and I'm grateful for the instruction and direction he received here. Two things make me particularly glad to be giving uh, this lecture. Well, one thing first is that uh, I learned about this lecture from the student, Bruce Bowerman, who said he got a good deal of direction in life uh, from the lectures themselves. But this occasion is special for a couple of reasons for me. First, it allows me to pay public tribute to Nancy Landon Cassebaum, whose intelligence, intelligent and generous support of medical research have made my current job a lot more easy, and whose gracious friendship has made life in Washington much more pleasant. Kansas should be, and I know is, very proud of her. Secondly, the inclusion of at least two scientists, Carl Sagan and myself, on the Lander, Landon lecture program this year recognizes the enormous but often overlooked significance of science 
in the workings of our society. I want to thank the organizers, the organizing committee, uh, for featuring science in this way. Now, I learned yesterday uh, that unfortunately, uh, Carl Sagan will not be able to speak as scheduled. And so I'd like to begin uh, by usurping a few of his words from his book, Broca's Brain, at the outset. There have been astonishing recent findings, he wrote in 1974, 21, 22 years ago, on the exploration of the planets, the collision of continents, the evolution of the human species, and the nature of the genetic code, which determines our heredity and makes us cousins to all the other plants and animals on this planet. Recent findings on these questions can be understood by any intelligent person, and there are many of them in this room. Civilizations can be characterized, he wrote, by how people approach such questions, how they nurture the mind as well as the body. Many of the problems facing us may be soluble, but only if we are, if we are willing to embrace brilliant, daring, and complex solutions. These words provide a useful backdrop for what I have to say today and presumably for what Carl uh, would have said next week and hopefully will say to you later in the year. Now, I am here today as the director of the National Institutes of Health, not as an individual scientist. And for that reason, I will say very little, but a little bit, about my own scientific work. Instead, I will concentrate on one of the overarching themes that makes the work of the NIH so exciting intellectually and so promising for the nation's health. I'll also address aspects of the work that challenge us to adapt as a society so that we can make use of new truths without abandoning old values. First, I want to tell you a few things about the NIH itself. We are a confederacy with over 20 semi-autonomous units, each dedicated to the study of either an organ like the heart or a disease like cancer. With a budget of nearly 12 billion, that's B, 12 billion dollars, we have the largest responsibility for federal support of science uh, outside of defense. We spend our money in two ways. About 10% of our budget pays for the work of a, oops, sorry. Is that visible to you? About 10% of our money pays for the work of several thousand scientists in our own clinical and laboratory programs, largely on our Bethesda Maryland campus that's shown on this slide. The rest of our money, over 80%, is distributed to academic and research institutions throughout the country as grants based on competitive review of applications by scientific peers. For example, in Kansas, we support 175 projects at 10 different institutions at an annual cost of over $30 million. All of this activity is based on the beliefs, two beliefs, that science can benefit health and that the support of fundamental health-promoting science is the responsibility of an enlightened government. When Franklin Roosevelt uh, dedicated the NIH campus in Bethesda in October 1940, on the eve of World War II, he said, and he's saying it in this picture, we cannot be a strong nation unless we are a healthy nation. And so we must recruit not only men and materials, but also knowledge and science in the service of national strength. Now, I realize there's a mild irony here. The man being honored by this lectureship, your great former uh, governor, Alf Landon, had to lose his bid for the presidency in 1936 to allow FDR to speak these inspiring words. <laughs> and I was pleased to learn last night that Mr. Landon, another hero of mine, was also a fan of FDR. My purpose today is not to enumerate the past successes of the NIH. Instead, I want to describe what I see as a yet more exciting future. I want you to understand uh, why the Congress and the President uh, have agreed to provide a handsome 5.8 percent increase in funding for the NIH this year, a year, as you all know, when many highly valued agencies of government face a still uncertain future. I also hope to encourage some of you, I gather there are high school students uh, from uh, other towns in Kansas brought in for this event, to seek careers in biology and related fields. And I want to acquaint all of you with changes that are likely to occur in the practice of medicine over the next 50 years or so. Now, nearly everyone has heard or read that great discoveries are being made frequently, almost daily, in the health sciences. These discoveries concern many different medical problems, 
but most of them are based on work with genes. The concept of a gene has been around for a long time, serving to describe the inheritance of observable traits like the colors of eyes or of plants. But in the new biology, the gene is more than a concept. It is a physical thing, touchable. It can be isolated from cells in pure form, analyzed in full detail, multiplied a million fold in a test tube, changed at will, and even used as medical treatment. Along our 23 sets of chromosomes present in the nucleus of each of our cells, there reside nearly 100,000 genes. Each gene is part of an extremely long chemical chain called DNA, the now familiar two-stranded or double helix, which I hope you're able to see. Uh, the strands are composed of only four chemical constituents, which are along the bottom of the slide, perhaps a little difficult to observe. These constituents are referred to as bases, and we abbreviate them by their initials, A, C, T, and G. Now, despite this apparent simplicity, the order of the three billion, yes, again, B, billion A, C, Ts, and Gs in human DNA has enormous information content. In a language that is essentially universal, DNA provides to all kinds of cells, and animals, and plants, and bacteria, the instructions for making proteins, the enzymatic workhorses, and the building blocks of cells. To make protein, the DNA is first read out in the form of a related chemical called RNA in the same code. And the RNA is then translated to make protein. For those familiar with computers, DNA is like the information on a hard disk. RNA is like the same information on a floppy disk. And protein is like the product of that information displayed in readable form on the screen. All of you who've had elementary biology know that reproduction is an essential property of life forms. When DNA itself is reproduced, mistakes occasionally occur. This isn't surprising, since each of the cells in our body contains the same three billion A, C, Ts, and Gs. Our cells are equipped with tools to proofread and correct such typographical errors. But nevertheless, error correction is not perfect. The changes that remain, known as mutations, sometimes have very little consequence and may even have some benefit. But as shown here, mutations may also cause ineffective proteins to be made. And furthermore, mutations may be transmitted when cells divide. If those mutations have occurred in germ cells, eggs or sperm, they can be transmitted to future generations. For all these reasons, the changes that occur in our DNA are the source of our joys and our sorrows. They are the origins of our diversity as a species and as individuals. They are the causes of many of the diseases that, that we suffer or our, pre, our predispositions to disease. And they are the instruments of cancer and other disorders that arise during our lifetimes. The study of life's great molecules, DNA, RNA, and protein, has been gradually transforming biology and medicine for the past 40 years. But in the past few years, that transformation has been accelerated exponentially by international efforts to determine the placement and the sequence of all the genes in the human chromosomes. That is to decipher the order of all the bases in human DNA, the totality of which is known as the genome give you some idea of the enormity of that task, if we imagine each of the letters in DNA to be roughly a millimeter in size, just large enough to read with the naked eye, a complete sequence would stretch from here in Manhattan to San Diego. Our country plays a leading role in this effort through a program funded by the NIH and by the Department of Energy, a program known as the Human Genome Project. By, by the year 2005, and perhaps earlier, we'll have a complete map of each of our 23 chromosomes, one of which is shown here, knowing the position of each gene, knowing the position of each sequence, knowing the order of the bases in and between each gene. Already, several thousands of genes have been partially deciphered, 
including at least 50 that are known to govern major inherited diseases like cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, other neurological disorders, some forms of cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Families with such inherited diseases, families in which a very high risk of serious illness is determined by a single misspelling of one of these genes, provide some of the most compelling stories from this biological frontier. I will soon con consider a couple of these stories, but before I do so, I want to make a more general point about disease. All disease represents a complex interplay between environmental and genetic factors. Some environmental factors are obvious, invading microbes, for example, but others are subtle, complex, poorly understood. Conversely, the influence of genes on disease can be much more complex and subtle than the examples of genetic disease I'll discuss in more detail in a moment. And there are at least three reasons for saying that uh, genetic factors may have very subtle effects. First of, us, first of all, each of us brings to, into our lives susceptibilities of different kinds to environmental causes of disease. And that susceptibility is determined by the genes we inherit from our parents. And in fact, in each case, the susceptibility is likely to be determined by multiple genes. So high blood pressure, addictive and other psychiatric disorders, diabetes, coronary artery disease, are common conditions influenced by multiple genes in combination with diet, behavior, economic status, and other environmental factors. Secondly, some diseases, most clearly cancers, are caused by mutations that occur during our lifetimes, not by inherited mutations. Third, genes encode proteins that govern the behavior, the physiology of healthy and diseased tissues and cells. Hence, knowing genes helps us to understand and to counter disease. Now, I'm gonna take a liberty here to illustrate this last important point with a brief, somewhat self-indulgent anecdote from my own area of research. This will be as scientific as the talk gets. It'll get back into a less scientific mode in a moment. Over 20 years ago, my colleagues and I at University of California, San Francisco, identified a normal gene called SARC, S-R-C, as the source of a viral gene capable of causing tumors in infected chickens. The SARC gene was the first of a large group of genes now known as oncogenes, some of which are actively involved in the development of human cancers. The point I want to make here, though, is not about cancer. The normal functions of oncogenes, the reason we have oncogenes in our chromosomes, were, was obscure for many years. Recently, scientists have learned to alter the chromosomes of mice to change or eliminate individual genes. When, when mice were deprived of their normal SARC gene, they were found to have a dramatic, surprising disease called osteopetrosis. Their bones are, are abnorm abnormally thick. There is too much bone. Now, ordinarily, bone is continually being made, even in, the, in adults, by one cell type and being continually removed by another. In mice without a SARC gene, the bone removing cell, called an osteoclast, doesn't work properly. Now, in patients with osteoporosis, an important human disease, especially common in older women, there is too little bone. The bone is too thin. If the bone removing osteoclast in these patients could be slowed down, for example, by inhibiting the SARC protein, bones might be strengthened. Now, as revealed in this recent clipping from the Wall Street Journal, biotechnology companies are vigorously pursuing such ideas. Now, inhibitors of osteoclasts to treat osteoporosis uh, are still in the future, but the impact of genetic knowledge on health is already accelerating. Readers of the New York Times Sunday Magazine were recently taught this lesson by Charles Siebert, the author of an emotionally wrenching article about a genetic disease affecting his own family. Siebert was approaching the age at which his father died prematurely of an uncommon heart condition called hypertrophic 
cardiomyopathy. It's a mouthful, but it's a fancy term for a sick heart that's too big. Now, Siebert consulted Dr. Lemev Fanana Pazir at the NIH Clinical Center to find out whether he had inherited his father's condition. During this quest, he confronted some important and troubling questions. Do I want to know the answer? Will it help me to know? Or would, in his words, a gene predisposing me to an incurable condition only hobble rather than help my existence? In other words, could such knowledge be toxic? Along the way of thinking about these questions, he learned many interesting things about the disease. First, he learned that it was caused by a, by a variety of different mutations that changed the shape and the function of the proteins shown in this diagram, like myosin, that work as a coordinated unit, a kind of machine, to allow the heart muscle to pump blood. Now, we know a lot about some of the proteins in this contractile machine. For example, we have a three-dimensional precise picture of the myosin component. And although it may be difficult for you to see, uh, the numbers surrounding that structure show the pictures or the location of several mutational changes that weaken the myosin part of the heart's pump. Now, when the heart's muscle is weak, blood is less effectively pumped to the rest of the body. The heart tries to compensate by making more heart muscle. And in these thickened walls of the heart shown on the right, the diseased heart, the electrical impulses that govern the heart's rhythm may fail. This is probably the most common explanation for the sudden deaths of young athletes you occasionally read about in the paper. Siebert also learned that the disease is quite unpredictable. This is a family tree with different generations shown at different levels. The circles are females, the squares are males. In some families, people who inherit the same mutant myosin gene have very different consequences for reasons still unknown. In this family, for example, some individuals shown in white had no symptoms, some shown in yellow had fainting spells from abnormal heart rhythms, and some shown in orange died suddenly of cardiac death. It is not necessarily useless to diagnose this disease. When this young boy was brought to the hospital with a bruised forehead, fainting spells were suspected. This electrocardiogram shown here showed in the, in the middle panel interruptions of his heart rhythm, some interruptions, total lack of contraction, long enough to cause blackouts. His DNA was later shown to harbor a mutant myosin gene inherited from one of his parents. Shown here, outfitted with a new cardiac pacemaker, he now plays ball for Jay's restaurant. <laughs> Before deciding whether to treat his DNA, to test his DNA for myosin gene mutation, the author, Siebert, traveled to a farm town in the Midwest to meet a large family affected with this uncommon disease. It is an encounter that makes the disease real for the reader, as it did for Siebert. Just as these pictures of a Kansas family, neighbors of yours, must bring it home to you, and this is a family with this disease, fairly benign symptoms, uh, faces probably hard to see from where you're sitting, uh, that resembles the family that Siebert visited. But in Siebert's story, we are not told the name or even the location. We're told Midwest, not clear whether it's Kansas or Minnesota. For, and we're not told that information for a single important reason. Most affected members of the family have lost their medical insurance, and the few who still have it are afraid of losing it. Yet another reason for Siebert to think that genetic knowledge may be toxic. Now, Siebert has decided to postpone any further efforts to learn whether he has inherited his father's bad gene. Without symptoms, uh, he might not have much to gain from being certain about the mutation, and he might have a lot to lose. Breast cancer can give us another, more highly publicized perspective on genetic diseases. Cancer of the breast is a common disease among women in the industrialized world. Nearly 200,000 cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed in this country this year, and over 40,000 women will die of the disease. 
In the vast majority of these women, there is no reason to implicate an inherited mutant gene. But in the families of roughly five to 10% of women with breast cancer, including the mother and the grandmother pictured here, a simple pattern of inheritance can be discerned. In about half of these families, the mutant gene is called BRCA for breast cancer one, located on chromosome 17. Most of the other families have mutations in another gene called BRCA2 on a different chromosome. Unlike the situation with the myosin gene, we have very little idea what these two genes do. Virtually nothing is known about the proteins they make. Yet women who inherit a mutant form of BRCA1 have a much greater likelihood of developing breast cancer than do other women. This may be difficult for you to see, but uh, Roughly 85 to 90 percent of these women develop breast cancer by the age of 60 to 70, and the cancers tend to appear quite early in life, frequently between the ages of 30 and 50. Knowing so little about these genes, is it useful to test women for mutations in them? Shouldn't all women, after all, be using mammography to try to detect breast cancers early anyway? Let me show you one family in which the information was very useful. Now, the woman denoted by the arrow in the center near the bottom, the blue woman uh, in the right-hand group, was cons was came to visit my NIH colleague, Frances Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, because her two sisters, her mother and her mother's sister, had all developed breast cancer at an early age. As a result, she had decided to have her breasts removed surgically as a preventive measure against what she assumed to be a certain fate. When her DNA was tested, however, she was found not to carry the BRCA mutation present in her affected relatives, who are colored yellow here for having the gene. She canceled her surgery, she cheered up considerably, very positive effects of a negative test. Effects of this kind should not be overlooked in our debates about genetic testing. Now, the patient had a 39-year-old female cousin, shown over here on the left, the most uh, the left-hand position. This cousin thought she was not at high risk because her closest relatives with breast cancer were aunts. But she was found to have the mutant gene which she received from her cancer-free father. Informed of this news, she had her first mammogram, a test that would not normally be advised for a woman of her age. That mammogram is shown here. I'm not sure you'll be able to see it. Uh, you definitely won't be able to read this. But the mammogram detected an early breast tumor, which was removed with a very high probability of cure. Do these stories mean that all women with a family history of breast cancer, or even all women, should be tested for mutations in the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes? This is a hotly debated issue. For a few months after the discovery of the BRCA1 gene last year, the answer seems moot because the gene is very large and the mutations occur at many different positions within the gene. Those positions are denoted by dots below the schematic representation of the gene. Thus, the expense and the difficulty of the test added to other problems, the very little that could be done if a, if a test were positive, the risk of losing insurance, the worry, and the damage to self-image. So only a few tests were being done in experimental settings and with families known to be at high risk. But very recently, the situation has changed. It was discovered that about 1%, quite a high number, of all Jewish women and, of course, men originating from Eastern Europe, so-called Ashkenazi Jews, have exactly the same mutation, deletion of two so-called bases from a single spot shown over here on your left in the BRCA1 gene. Testing specifically for this mutation is easy, it's cheap. The indications are also strong that this mutation, like the others, strongly predisposes women to breast cancer. Now, understandably, given the odds and the expense, many Jewish women want to know, yes or no, do I have this mutation? But how do we ensure these tests are accurately performed? 
At what age is it appropriate to test women to see if they have it? When do we, what do we advise those with positive results to do? Could, for example, frequent mammography, too frequent mammography, be harmful in such women? Is it advisable to suggest that women have their breasts removed? Is that, is that even fully protective against breast cancer? Women with mutations in this gene also have a high risk of ovarian cancer. What is the best way to screen for that? And what reproductive advice should we give these women? How will we pr protect the privacy of the results so that tested individuals are not discriminated against by employers, insurers, or even prospective mates? Now, this dilemma that I've sketched out for you in, in the case of BRCA1 is only a prominent example of the many that are being raised as genetics and molecular biology transform medicine. Although these questions are daunting, they are not, for me, reasons to turn away from the pursuit. New knowledge always raises new problems, but it is always, almost always proven superior to ignorance. The genetic revolution I have tried to describe will produce amazing changes in the practice of medicine, at least in the highly developed and more affluent parts of the world. For this to happen, those who provide medical care will have to become much more familiar with genetics than they are at present. People will need to become used to the idea that their prospects for health care can be gauged early in life by, by genetic tests. Now, there'll still be ample opportunity for more traditional means to, uh, to predict success in love and business. But I think we're failing on this projection here. There it is. But DNA tests will be used for the relatively common mutations that predispose to cancer, heart disease, and other ills, and for mutations that are suspected to exist in families because of family histories. This information will guide and hopefully even inspire strategies that prevent disease or detect it at early stages. Within the next 50 years, there will likely be many therapies based on some of the genetic discoveries I've been describing. In a few cases, genes themselves will be used to replace mutant genes or to treat cancers or infectious illnesses. More commonly, there will be potent drugs based on an, on, on an understanding of disease in genetic and molecular terms, as I suggested earlier when I discussed osteoporosis. But there will remain serious concerns, even within this promising picture. We will not have resolved a thorny issue about the decisions we make to transmit our genes to our progeny. As individuals, every one of us in this room will have to accept the idea that we all carry mutant genes we would pre have preferred not to have received. Many people already use genetic testing of embryos or early fetuses to prevent the rare devastating illnesses caused by some, of some such genes, such as severe anemia, cystic fibrosis, or childhood neurological diseases. But soon we'll be able to consider whether to transmit diseases that predispose to the more common adult illnesses, such as early breast cancer or heart disease. These will be difficult decisions for individuals and pre will present serious dilemmas for our society. To make any further progress, we have an immediate political issue to resolve. We must insist that all states and the federal government pass laws to protect our citizens from abuses of genetic information. Recently, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission ruled that the Americans with Disabilities Act Pre prevents job discrimination based on genetic information. This will help. But strong laws that guarantee the privacy of genetic information and protection from reprisals by insurance companies will be essential. And currently, only a few states, Kansas not among them, have such laws. Provisions in Senator Kassebaum's proposed Health Insurance Reform Act are especially enlightened in this respect. Now, I have taken this discussion well beyond the scientific arena into politics, law, and ethics to illustrate some ways in which the genetic revolution in biology will affect us all, will require the talents of many who are not scientists. 
and will compel all of us to understand the principles on which this revolution in biology rests. To reinforce this point, let me give Carl Sagan the final words, quoting again from his book, Broca's Brain. And I quote, the compassionate application of, a, of new technology to human problems requires a deep understanding of human nature and human culture, a general education in the broadest sense. We are at a crossroads in human history. Never before has there been a moment so simultaneously perilous and promising. Now, he was speaking about nuclear power, but he, it could have been genetics when he says, we are the first species to have taken our evolution into our own hands. There is not much time to determine which fork of the road we are committing our ch to which we are committing our children and our future. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Varmus has agreed to take some questions here this morning, and as you know, we have microphones set up on either your right or left, so if you want to proceed to the appropriate mic, we will take some questions if you have any. I know there are some questions out there. Do you have any current information other than what the press has done on the individual that did the uh, baboon cell transplant when it comes to this type of research and ethnicity? So information about what the press? Say again. Well, all, all that we've heard is what the press has come out, like, right. you know, he's feeling good, that type of thing. Right. Well, there's a very important issue here. So for those of you who don't know this story, uh, an AIDS patient in San Francisco named Jeff Garrity um, received a transplantation of marrow cells from a baboon. The intent here was to introduce into his body a healthy blood system from an animal whose cells cannot be infected by the AIDS virus. And the hope was that if that cell population flourished in the patient's body, it would be impossible for the virus to infect it. The difficulty everyone anticipates is that uh, either the, ma the, the baboon cells will not flourish in a human, a human body, or that they will be unable to function to carry out the activities that are normally carried out, for example, by the immune system. What we know so far is the patient survived the immediate period of transplantation and ap appears to be doing well. One crucial test is about to occur, and that is to ask whether the cells that are currently supporting that patient are his own cells or the baboon cells. We don't know the answer to that yet. The effort was to eliminate his own cells before introducing the baboon cells, but whether that uh, procedure was adequate to eliminate his own cells is not clear. If it turns out that most of his blood cells are of baboon origin, the next crucial issue will be whether they function to defend him immunologically against uh, invading uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi. That's an extremely important issue about which many immunologists are skeptical, and we'll have to see what the results of those two stages of, of trial uh, turn out to be. I don't know the answers yet. Um, you talked about the uh, consequences of uh, knowing someone, uh, testing genetics, and finding out someone not had a deadly disease. Is there concern that there might be psychological effects on people who um, have are tested genetically and find that they have deadly diseases? Yes. Well, let me make one thing clear at the start. That is that a test for a mutation is not a test for a disease. It's a test for the mutation doesn't say that you have the disease, it says you carry the mutation which predisposes you to the disease. Now, there is an additional subtlety here that I didn't bring out in the lecture, which is that some diseases are, 
are caused by inheriting a single mutant gene, and some require that both copies of the gene be mutated. So you remember your, the, the only genetics people sometimes have learned is that you inherit one set of genes from your mother and one from your father. So you have two copies of every gene. In the cases that I described, I made it simple. I used diseases where all you've got to have is a single bad copy. But in a disease like cystic fibrosis, it's required that you have two bad copies of the cystic fibrosis gene in order to develop the disease. But it is potentially important to know whether you're a carrier, whether you have one copy of the gene, of the, of the mutant gene, which can be transmitted to your offspring. And since one in 25 people, probably dozens of people in this room, are carriers of the cystic fibrosis mutation, uh, an inappropriate matching of individuals can yield a one in four risk that offspring uh, have cystic fibrosis. That's the first subtle. The second is that, that, uh, that not every mutation will necessarily produce symptoms of the disease. Recall that I talked about uh, patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who have family members with the same mutation and no symptoms. So this is an example of what we call penetrance, that not everybody who has the mutation necessarily gets the disease. Having said all that by way of clarifying some of these minor points, um, let me agree with you that, uh, yes, the, the psychological damage can be enormous. Uh, in the story by Charles Siebert that appeared in the New York Times, he learns from a, the head of our genetic counseling program at NIH, there are basically two kinds of people in the world, those who want to know and those who don't want to know. <laughs> and that makes sense. Some people, uh, even now, would very much prefer to know whether they have a BRCA1 mutation or a, a, a heart disease mutation, so they can then make appropriate decisions about how to live their lives. Uh, perhaps they want to, you know, make, do family planning of a certain kind, or think about uh, their wills, or, or, or make other, or think about uh, whether they're going to, going to have children. Um, that requires one kind of, of, of mental outlook. The other kind is uh, obviously exhibited by, by Charles Siebert himself, who who decided that uh, since he didn't have symptoms now, he would find it much worse to live with the idea that he had the mutation. Now, I remind you that uh, one outcome of the test might be to reveal to him that he doesn't have the mutation. And maybe it would improve his life tremendously to know he doesn't have it if he's a warrior. So uh, I think this is a, th these are very subtle issues uh, about which we need much more thought, and we need more people trained in these issues because one of the consequences of the change in biology that I'm describing is that we're going to have many more people, probably all of you, tested for something. And we want to be able to gauge appropriately whether you're those, among those who want to know or those who don't want to know and uh, give you good advice about how to deal with that information. Next. Um, during the last week, we've heard a lot of stories about developments for new drugs for uh, HIV AIDS, and yes. I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what you see as the prospects uh, for these new drug treatments and also uh, what to look for in the future as we hear about developments right. regarding them. Well, I've been arguing for some years that our greatest hope in this country for making real progress against AIDS and HIV is the development of a multi-drug treatment program for HIV, that the vaccine program is not looking very promising, in the sh at least in the short run, uh, and that the best thing we could do is take advantage of the many advances that have been made in virology to understand the individual genes of the virus, the kinds of proteins the virus makes in order for the virus to grow. What you heard about last week was the very promising set of initial results that have come from a new set of drugs that attack the second of three enzymes that HIV makes in order for HIV to grow. HIV ma basically makes three kinds of enzymes, one to make HIV DNA, one to cut proteins, and one to stick its DNA into chromosomes. The drugs you know about, like AZT, are directed against the enzyme that makes DNA. And as you know, uh, those drugs have some beneficial effects but it appears that, uh, that viruses resistant to those drugs arise as mutants. And the, the, the mutation process I've described here today is very applicable to thinking about HIV. 
The second class of drugs directed against the protein cutting enzyme seems to be not only equally if not more effective, but so far the resistance to those drugs appears to occur a little less rapidly. The important thing is the combination, using the drugs against one enzyme in combination with drugs against the other. And my hope is that with drugs against the third enzyme and perhaps other kinds of drugs, we'll be able to put together drug cocktails that allow people with HIV to lead normal lives. These drugs will probably not ever completely eliminate the virus from the body. But if we can control the virus so that people live a normal lifespan with the absence of symptoms, just as they do for the first few years after they're, they're infected, that we'll have uh, the, the ability to, to avoid AIDS even though patients are HIV infected. Now that does not answer the question of HIV worldwide. These drug combinations are expensive and they have to be administered carefully. Many parts of the world, in Asia and Africa in particular, where HIV is now uh, very common, we're going to need vaccines. And I don't see the answer to the vaccine problem yet, but there's a great deal more interest than there has been in the past at NIH uh, for developing uh, such vaccines. Um, they have found a virus that causes CFIDS, a retrovirus, spumavirus. I was wondering if you knew of any uh, genetic manipulations perhaps to try to dismantle that virus? Uh, first of all, I don't know the report you're referring to. She's referring to, uh, there have been many attempts to find a causative agent for chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, so far, each of the claims for causation has fallen flat. I don't know about the recent one. I don't know if it's true. Uh, if there were a viral cause, which would not surprise most of us, um, there are tools present, general tools, that could allow the dismemberment and the study of, of, any, of any virus. But um, I don't know if the claims that he's making are accurate. Thank you. Um, what is your personal um, view and the NIH's view on the theory of you? We hope they're the same, right? Yeah, of the overuse of antibiotics uh, causing the emergence of more drug-resistant um, bacteria and viruses right. coming out today. Well, uh, it's, the issue is irrelevant to viruses because viruses are not susceptible to antibiotics. But the issue of uh, whether excessive use of antibiotics is generating antibiotic-resistant strains of bacteria, is, uh, it, there's a very clear view of that that's been around for a long time. That is that that uh, it's important and increasingly important, especially in hospitals, when, when bacterial infections are being treated in hospitalized patients, to be sure that you're using the appropriate antibiotics at the right time. That is, that antibiotics are not being used promiscuously, but are being used only to treat bacteria that are known to be resistant, to, to, to susceptible to the antibiotic in question. Uh, the, emergence of strains of bacteria that are resistant to virtually all uh, available antibiotics is becoming a very a significant problem. It's not going to be, uh, it's not in the near future going to be uh, a problem that decimates the population by any means, but it is an issue that presents a very serious problem in particular for hospitalized patients who are subjected to an environment in the hospital where many treatments with antibiotics have been, have been used and the organisms that abound in the hospital setting are likely to include a high proportion of antibiotic resistant organisms. I'm just curious to know what is some of the common research that has uh, found breakthroughs in determining or destroying or how to destroy uh, viruses in general? Uh, well, this is a, uh, I'm a, at, at, at uh, bottom a virologist and most of us who went into virology thought that one of the things that would happen when we understood viruses at the most fundamental level is that we would appreciate their differences from the cells that they infect and therefore it would be possible to devise targeted missiles, uh, drugs that would specifically interfere with the life cycle of viruses. That has not been very productive. By far the most effective antiviral maneuver we have is vaccine or in the case of transfusion-transmitted uh, viruses, checking 
the uh, transfused blood to be sure it's free of viruses. That having been said, uh, there are a few examples of, uh, of drugs that appear to have pretty substantial antiviral effects. One way in which research on AIDS is benefiting everybody is that uh, the, the intense study of AIDS, the attempt to develop the anti-HIV drugs that I described a moment ago, is affecting many other uh, aspects of virology. For example, hepatitis B virus, in many ways, is a virus like uh, the, the, the retroviruses that cause, that cause AIDS and other, other illnesses. And there are now more effective drugs uh, in the pipeline for, for um, treating hepatitis B infections. My hope is that the lessons that we learn from the study of HIV are going to have enormous dividends in the study of other viral illnesses. But the number of antiviral agents is, to me, as a virologist of 25 years standing, very disappointing. Okay, let's take one more question. Next. I have a question on the development of NIH policies. Uh, and the background here is that we see that there's a number of transgenic species that have been developed uh, and are very, very useful in scientific research, for instance, the transgenic mice. Uh, it's not that far-fetched that several genetic defects could be cured in a germ cell by transgenic um, developments in human lines. If this isn't so unfeasible in its development, what's being done to determine the policy of, of would this even be useful? Yes. Uh, and who determines this policy? Okay. First of all, let me say that uh, uh, during the course of my talk, I said very little about the prospects of trying to cure genetic diseases by using gene delivery systems, so-called gene therapy. And I was hesitant about that because I feel that gene therapy has gotten a great deal of play in the press as a potential therapy, but that efforts so far to do gene therapy in a variety of diseases has been quite unrewarding. Recently, I put together a panel of distinguished scientists to review the entire gene therapy portfolio at the NIH, and the general consensus was that, that while we need still to do some clinical trials, we're overemphasizing the clinical research in this area while neglecting the basics that need to be worked out, how genes should be delivered, what cells to deliver them to, how the, how the genes will be expressed in those cell types. The second point is that up until now, we have all been operating under the rule that gene therapy is directed only to so-called somatic cells, cells in your lungs or your skin or your muscle, but not to the so-called germ cells, that is, cells that uh, could result in the transmission of any introduced gene to one's progeny, because that obviously is one of the secondary effects that many of us are anxious about that would result from um, trying to make, as you say, transgenic humans uh, with, uh, with genes that would, would remediate uh, a, 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 a disease-causing or disease-predisposing gene. So at the moment, it's standing policy that we don't approve experiments in humans, kind of clinical trials, that address germline gene therapy. Nevertheless, as you point out, the advent of transgenic technology, the ability to introduce into the germline of mice and other animals, uh, including agricultural animals, uh, genes that are beneficial to the animal, has raised this, the issue of whether we should reconsider it. Uh, at the moment, the, all we're doing is we've, we've asked the National Academy of Sciences, in collaboration with some other agencies, to re-examine this issue and see whether uh, there is uh, sufficient anticipated benefit from such procedures to take uh, a step that would uh, be, I think, a uh, uh, cause for concern among, among the citizenry. Uh, that decision would ultimately be made at the very highest levels of our government uh, because uh, clearly uh, before we went ahead uh, at, with, with that, it would be necessary for the president to approve uh, NIH funding of research that would, be, uh, that would have effects on, on the human germline. Dr. Varmus, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Would you please join with me in giving him another hand? Thank you very much. And good morning. <laughs>